This is Duke University. Welcome again to those of you who uh, were with us this morning and welcome to those who are just joining us for the first time to the 2013 Gardner C. Taylor Lecture Series. Our speaker, our lecturer, is the Reverend Martha Simmons and we know that she is an associate minister at Rush Memorial United Church of Christ in Atlanta, Georgia and she currently resides there but is a native of Chula, Mississippi. Reverend Simmons is the preaching scribe for this generation. Uh, she is the editor of Preaching with Sacred Fire, African American Sermons 1750 to the Present, and Doing the Deed, the Mechanics of 21st Century Preaching, which is now the fastest selling African American preaching study guide. We are so grateful to have her with us. She preached a dynamic sermon this morning, uh, is your name on the visitor's log, amen? And we look forward to hearing the prophetic word that she will bring to us this afternoon. So without much further ado, let us welcome again the Reverend Martha Simmons. hope that you all can now can you hear me I will use my preacher's voice <laughs> we were in seminary and someone said use your preacher's voice and you know because you were we were women then and there were so few of us whenever they said that our voices would go down then someone said Simmons your voice doesn't need to go down you just use your preacher's voice amen Amen. To, again, to Dean Hayes uh, in his absence. Where is he here? Oh, in, who is present? Amen. Amen. To Dean Hayes, uh, to Dr. Terman, Director of the Office of Black Church Studies, um, who is just a, a jewel, a jewel of the church. And uh, I'm just proud to tell folk I know her. Amen. And uh, she is doing, she has done marvelous things for the church, but we are expecting so many other amazing things to Dr. Luke Powery, uh, a jewel of the church, Dr. Joseph Jennings, uh, who is here and one of the uh, black church studies department faculty who were kind enough to wine and dine me last evening. Thank you so, so much um, for that. Um, to all faculty present, all students, alum, um, and again to the people who travel distances to be with me, Reverend Kay Monet Rice, who's the assistant chaplain, associate chaplain, excuse me, for Wake Forest University, to um, Dr. Robert Scott, who pastors all the way in St. Louis, uh, he and his family, and uh, to uh, one of the, and I'm about, to, I'm about to coin a word. If you are, have a preach for any length of time, you coin words. Amen? Amen. You coin words. In fact, if you are a parent, you learn to coin words. Amen? So I'm about to coin one. Uh, to one of my children, my children who is here, one of my sons in ministry, uh, and he is one of the preachingest, preachingest <laughs> preachers that I know in the person of Reverend Reginald Bell who drove uh, over two hours just to come and say, Mom, I support you. Uh, I love you madly, Reginald Bell. Amen, amen. Um, this afternoon, and to uh, any other special guests, if I forgot anyone, uh, please uh, forgive me. Also to uh, Reverend Carl Kenny, uh, excuse me, who made uh, the made the drive. Uh, God bless you for for that. Um, God bless each of you for being here. Um, I wrote uh, an entire lecture, as I always do when I'm going to. 
uh, seminary two uh, lecture, but what I've learned is that I rarely get to do the whole lecture because the Spirit will start to speak and say, it's time for you to stop and let the Q&A begin. Let the Q&A begin. So we'll see when the Spirit moves today. Uh, I am honored to be printing, uh, excuse me, be uh, preaching and lecturing on this occasion, uh, the Gardner Taylor Lecture Series that have been combined with uh, services and activities for Duke alum. This is a wonderful time to be here. Over the last 264 plus years, the African American church, I am missing my glasses. <laughs> Purple. <laughs> I can read a little while with them, but uh, not long. <laughs> Amen. And uh, Dean Hayes, I'm actually going to try to get me some real glasses, but these drugstore things do work. <laughs> that drugstore work, man. Walgreens fix you right up. <laughs> Amen. 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 Had them in color. <laughs> Over the last 264 years, the African American church has produced an unmatched body of men and women who have lived and practiced the art of sacred eloquence. Their sermons, writings, and other intellectual contributions fill the shelves and files of churches, college seminaries, universities, libraries, bookstores, and the Internet. Their lights burn all over the world. Reverend Gardner Calvin Taylor is one of the most notable of this elect illustrious group. Long before most of us ever actually heard Reverend Gardner Calvin Taylor preach, we knew him as a legend among those who stood behind sacred desks. As a teenager, before I knew I was a preacher, I socialized with male preachers. And as preachers are wont to do from time to time, the list of the best preachers in America was always discussed. At every discussion, Pastor Gardner Calvin Taylor's name always made the list. We never had to argue about that name. In later years, I came to know Pastor Taylor personally when he served as a member of the advisory board of the African American pulpit, and he did that for nine years, and he was our only emeritus board member. Over the years, Dr. Taylor and I have made it a regular practice to dialogue about any number of subjects, especially preaching. We are all the beneficiaries of his expert labor. The world sat in rapt attention as he, for 71 years, stood as a premier practitioner of sacred eloquence. We are all forever grateful for the life and ministry of Reverend Gardner Calvin Taylor. There shall never be another like him. With that said, this afternoon I want to talk about changes in the mechanics of preaching at the dawn of the 21st century, particularly in African American context changes in the mechanics of preaching at the dawn of the 21st century, particularly as these changes have occurred in African-American context. Having focused on preaching for one reason or another almost week in and week out for the past 16 years and having preached almost twice that long, it's clear to me that some of the mechanics of preaching have changed particularly in African-American context. To know this, you only have to listen to sermons by premier practitioners prior to 1980 and to premier practitioners of the first decade of the 21st century. Now to changes in what those changes are, have been. The inability of preachers to write and deliver focused messages continues to be the main problem. This mechanical task is not going well for preachers. 
This problem cuts across racial lines, genders, and age groups. All who teach preaching see it year in and year out. And one sermon after another, we have preachers mounting their sermonic horses and riding in all directions. <laughs> preachers still fail to focus sermons, and many take listeners around the world and back to give a point that was just around the corner. In a well-focused sermon, listeners can see the use of the text throughout the message, including at the conclusion. When a focused sermon is given, listeners also will be able to easily identify the aim of the sermon and how it applies to them and their actions. They also will clearly know what the preacher hopes to have happen after the sermon is preached. Contrastingly, a lack of focus often causes preachers, especially those who preach sermons that are more than 30 minutes in length, to be repetitive and make the same point two or three different ways in the same sermon. There is no shortcut to focused preaching. Most good preachers are focused writers even if they do not enter the pulpit with a manuscript. If a preacher's sermons are continuously unfocused, the problem likely rests with his or her inability to write well and with a few other problems. First, the writing problem. All of my friends who teach in seminaries have bemoaned the horrible writing of their students. They are clear that if they were to fail students for poorly written sermons and papers, they would typically flunk large segments of all their classes. The Department of Education in its last national report, which came out in 2009, said that 32 million Americans lack basic prose literacy skills, meaning they cannot read a newspaper or the instructions on a bottle of pills. If one lacks basic prose literary skills, it will show up in his or her sermon writing and preaching. Sadly, good writing is no longer common in our society. And with the advent of certain technological inventions, along with a major decline in our educational system, good writing is becoming less common each year. However, and even those with writing problems would lose focus a lot less if they were to keep their sermons short. A second, and a second major reason for poor sermon focus is a lack of clarity in developing the behavioral focus of a sermon. I use the term behavioral focus grounded in mutuality and solidarity. Other commonly used terms are the sermon aim, the sermon purpose, the claim of the sermon, the proposition, and the big idea. But again, I prefer the term behavioral focus grounded in mutuality and solidarity. The behavioral focus is similar in some ways to what Henry H. Mitchell refers to as the behavioral purpose. The behavioral purpose is the hook on which one hangs a sermon. The entire sermon is structured according to the behavioral intent that a preacher determines. It asks, what do I want hearers to do? Not just think. As the pre and as the preacher, what will I do as a result of having heard this sermon? A behavioral purpose accompanies each sermon and is never written in cognitive or negative terms. As it seeks to positively impact behavior, it must be positive. It requires an inductive, not a deductive approach to preaching. Every sermon should aim for toward changed behavior. However, I am convinced more than ever that to reach hearers emotionally and cognitively, 
Preachers need to begin by determining a behaviorally focused homiletical aim that is rooted in mutuality and solidarity. Focus continues as a major problem because so many preachers continues to approach, continue to approach sermon preparation without a behavioral bottom line. And they do it with a long ranger approach. Dr. Christine Smith, the late Dr. Christine Smith, wrote almost 25 years ago in her book, Weaving the Sermon, she says there is a type of preaching that supports the dichotomy of preacher and community as separate and distinct realities. The questions would be different if sermons were designed to help a preacher construct a sermon event or a moment of proclamation that was rooted in solidarity. They might then read, in this moment of faith sharing, what are we trying to explore, create, or articulate together? What are our hopes as a community for these shared moments together? What do we hope will happen? These very different guiding questions, if used to shape our preaching, will root the process of proclamation much more deeply in creating mutuality and solidarity, end quote. After decades of hearing sermons, writing sermons, reading sermons, preaching sermons, grading sermons, hating sermons, being blessed by sermons, being angered by sermons, and being convicted by sermons, I believe the greater part of designing a well-written sermon is ensuring that it is behaviorally focused and grounded in mutuality and solidarity. Mutuality and solidarity are so important because Preachers can no longer afford, if they ever could, to prepare sermons without totally understanding that they do so within a community, not in isolation in their study, and that they are preaching to change behavior. What do I want people to do after having heard this sermon, and what will I as the preacher do? In the case of the African-American community, so much weight was placed on the shoulders of its early preachers. Their sermons and their lives had to fight slave masters and encourage people to remain hopeful while living through daily drudgery and daily hell. In many instances, these black preachers were the only voices in the entire community that were given a modicum of respect. And at least in the church, though often under the threat of death, the preacher could critique the slavery monetary-driven status quo and birth in listeners the courage to do the same. So it is no wonder that from these beginnings, future generations of preachers would come to see themselves and be seen as centers of proclamation. However, this was never the total picture. It is simply a matter of how history is written. The leaders always get the majority of the credit and often have their roles made larger than life, especially in a society focused on rugged individualism rather than a village model. The fact is, whether in the white or the black community or a community of any ethnicity, when it comes to the work of the church, it is always the congregation that is doing the lion's share of the building, the burden bearing and the praying and certainly the paying. It has always been the women, the deacons, the prayer warriors, the mission sisters, some of whom were lay preachers, who often led worship. Remember, from the mid-1700s to the mid-1900s, due to personnel shortages, lay people often kept churches going. So once and for all, let us put to rest this notion of the long ranger preacher preparing a sermon to be delivered to the people. Instead, during sermon preparation, let us shift toward behaviorally focused preaching that is grounded in solidarity and mutuality. This will aid in sermon focus and in less preacher worship and tele-evangelist superstar worship. The next change in the mechanics of preaching is the change from congregation-driven or communally-driven call-and-response to preacher-driven crawl-and-response. 
Call and response that is cooperative and communal is a hallmark of the African-American faith community. In this arrangement, neither the preacher nor the congregation is the leader. Instead, the spirit blows where she will, and all are blessed by the mutually consuming warmth of the Holy Ghost. This has been historically written about. Currently, if one were to visit a vibrant and high-energy African-American church, particularly those with pastors under age 50, they would likely hear the use of a string of urgings from the preacher during the sermon. Commonly used, commonly used urgings include, tell your neighbor, give the Lord either a hand clap of praise or some praise, touch two people and say, and say thus and so, say favor, say blessed, say I'm going higher, and you get the idea. Done in this same vein, other calls by preachers for responses include phrases such as, you missed it, this will shout you, and you missed your shout cue. There are still call and response moments that are cooperative, even in the former churches. However, when not in response to the preacher's urging, other than an occasional heartfelt amen, these calls and responses from the congregation are often calls for help for the preacher. Lord help, hold on preacher and pray church. <laughs> the amount of cooperative call and response has greatly decreased in black church settings. Once upon a time, one had to earn by preaching wealth, whether poorly, they could receive a plea for one's rescue if the preaching wasn't going well. That's all they had to do to get a response from the congregation. This is not so with preacher-driven call and response, which carries with it an air of entitlement. This rhetorical strategy was given broad usage, and some would say credence, as it was used more frequently beginning in the 1990s by well-known African-American televangelists and megachurch pastors and revivalists and even some non-African-American televangelists. While it is not problematic for a preacher to encourage call and response, one has to wonder what the intent is behind a barrage of never-ending calls for responses by preachers during their sermons. Surely it is not to encourage unity. The church has historically been able to deliver unified calls and responses without much urging by preachers. Is it to heighten enthusiasm for the gospel? Perhaps. But doesn't good preaching and well-planned liturgy do that? Perhaps there are good reasons for excessive preacher-driven call and response. I just can't name one. So I leave it up to each preacher to determine why they need to excessively, not occasionally, but excessively and consistently place calls for responses in sermons. Then there is the impact of technology on the mechanics of preaching. Sermons are now preceded by or accompanied by sounds, images on screens, and so much more. Technology is being used to establish a worship mood that drapes the sanctuary before sermons begin. We now have churches with drama and arts ministries, that work in conjunction with media ministries. These ministries can fill sanctuaries with shock and awe. Technology can be a blessing and a bane to preachers. Technology helps when it's used to bring forth the word with clarity and authenticity and to help the church expand the gospel and service to the least of these. Technology hurts when it becomes a crutch on which preachers lean to construct scenes and moods that they are unable to craft in their sermons due to their limited vocabulary, stunted homiletical imaginations, 
and barely formed theological minds. But per a perhaps more important discussion about technology that we are only starting to have concerns what technology is doing to us. Nicholas Carr, author of The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, writes that we are in a chronic state of distraction. End quote. We know this is true. We can't stop checking our phones for messages, texting, emailing, Googling, Facebooking, Instagramming, tweeting, or going to YouTube. Someone will probably check for a message or tweet before this lecture is concluded. This chronic state of distraction follows us, Carr says, long after we shut down our computers and other devices. Carr also points out that many have, become con have convinced themselves that surfing the web is a suitable, even superior substitute for deep reading and other forms of calm and attentive thought. The distractions in our lives have been proliferating for a long time, but never has there been a medium like the Internet. And devices such as smartphones that have been programmed to widely scatter our attention and to do it consistently and insistently. How can we become the focused preachers we should be if we are besieged with all of these distractions? How can we sit with the Word of God and just read it for the sake of reading it or read it to hear from God with so much to distract us? How do we turn all of the devices off long enough to spend devoted time with God? Further, technology has made us labor less over words. Carr also writes, when we go online, we enter an environment that promotes cursory reading, hurried and distracted thinking, and superficial learning. It's possible to think deeply while surfing the net, just like it's possible to think shallowly while reading a book. But that's not the type of thinking the technology of today encourages or rewards. When I tell preachers to read, 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 I do not mean skim, 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 cut and paste, make haste, and put a sermon together. <laughs> but today, this is what technology and culture encourage. The Internet encourages the rapid, distracted sampling of small bits of information from many sources. We are becoming ever more adept at scanning and skimming. But what we may be losing is our capacity for concentration, contemplation, and reflection, which also hurts our ability to write with depth, conviction, and without plagiarizing. We are also distracted in our preparation of sermons due to the belief that we must multitask. And technology lures us into the world of multitasking. Just turn on your laptop or your tablet and begin to pray a, prepare a sermon. Before you know it, an email pops up. Or an instant message or a note that someone on Facebook has sent you a message. Not to mention that as you are typing, your phone is never far away. And it's constantly crying out for your attention too. Do we want solitary, single-minded concentration when we prepare sermons, or do we want to become master multitaskers? I wonder if this is really a difficult question for those who are serious about preaching. Now, I'm not saying that technology or the new technology is evil. Carr's warning simply reminds us that we need to be aware of the real trade-offs between different kinds of media and take responsibility for the cultivation of our own mind. Finally, on the topic of technology, Tim Challies, author of The Next Story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion, says, 
we need disciplined discernment when it comes to technology. We need a theology of technology, end quote. We rely upon computers, cell phones, and the internet for communication, commerce, and entertainment. Yet even though we live in this instant message culture, many of us feel disconnected. And we question if all of this technology is really good for our souls. Ironically, it would appear that technology has had a much greater impact on the church in its past history than it seems to be having on her present life. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century was a great benefactor of the technological advances that introduced movable type into the world of printing. The Bible was more easily attainable for millions. Every preacher should ask why the church has not been a conspicuous benefactor of the technological developments of the 21st century any more than we have. Now, the next change in mechanics is the matter of less melody in African-American preaching. Less melody in African-American preaching. This means that many of today's African-American preachers are not hoopers, as the term has been historically used and will be explained below. This is not to say that the African-American faith community does not still love hooping. Likely the average African-American preacher would still hoop if he or she could. And some of today's best-known African-American preachers still who? All of the African-American preachers I have asked about hooping during my years in ministry, except one, and I don't think he was telling the truth, said that they would hoop if they could. Even if they didn't hoop regularly, they would at least like to have it in their preaching arsenal. What is hooping? In Preaching with Sacred Fire, African American Sermon 1750 to the Present, I wrote, in the introduction to Sacred Symphony, the chanted sermon of the black preacher, homiletician William Turner of Duke Divinity School writes, that which is variously referred to as hooping, intoning, chanting, moaning, or tuning is essentially melody. This particular style of melody is definable as a series of cohesive pitches, which have continuity, tonality, quasi-metrical phraseology, and formulary cadence. Dr. Turner wrote that. <laughs> Amen. Hooping is first melody. It can be identified by the fact that its pitches are logically connected and have prescribed punctuated rhythms which require certain modulations of the voice and it's often delineated by quasi-metrical phrasing, end quote. Hooping with extensive mel melody, also known as old school hooping, meaning hooping prior to the late 1970s, is less common, especially among those who are seminary trained. It has never been coming among women, mainly because it was, con it was considered a manly art form. And women had so few opportunities to see it modeled and to learn how to release it, even when it was shut up in their bones. Most of today's best-known African-American clergy, especially those on national television, do not hoop or do so sporadically. Old style hooping is also seen less because hooping has transitioned. On this point, I wrote in Sacred Fire, the first noticeable transition that occurred in hooping in more than 200 plus years was marked by the preaching of Reverend Charles Gilchrist Adams. When he became a revivalist of national note in the late 70s 
African-American audiences knew that his preaching was different. It was filled with multiple alliterative lit. It was serious. It could contain four or five crescendo moments that were as high as the typical sermon celebration or conclusion of most hoopers. And it had cadence, but it barely had any melody. Listers knew that it was not a typical form of hooping, but it resembled hooping. And connoisseurs of the art form knew that it was hooping. And so Adams was dubbed the Harvard Hooper. He is a Harvard graduate. The Adams style of hooping was much more subtle than those who hacked or even the melodic hoopers such as C.L. Franklin, father of Aretha Franklin. As with Adams, some other preachers placed tonality throughout the sermon. This is most often seen in the Church of God in Christ and other holiness Pentecostal faith communities. How, and they do so because they believe that holy, all holy communication must be done in what is considered holy tone. However, this is not what Adams or those whose preaching styles have evolved from his, this is not what they are doing. While his preaching is filled with a great deal of cadence, one becomes aware that he is not constantly signaling a movement toward what W.E.B. Du Bois called frenzy, more commonly known as shouting. Adams instead moves through a sermon with slight cadence, only as a, a vehicle of modulation. His cadence helps him modulate his continuous production of long alliterative lists. This is also referred to as producing runs and riffs. Those who stand in the Adams lineage also use cadence as a vehicle to modulate their production throughout the sermon. The post-1970 forms of hooping are much less melodic and filled with fewer pauses. They require a quick speech pace and can contain numerous crescendos and continuous cadence. This is good news for young preachers, and especially African-American female preachers. Although both groups would likely hoop if they could, since the transition has occurred, there is less pressure to try to learn this art form if one does not do it naturally. What's the next change that has occurred in the mechanics of preaching? There is the matter of speed in preaching. Have you noticed how much faster many of today's preachers preach? Having worked in publishing for quite some time, I know that those who give voice to audiobooks are recommended to speak 150 to 160 words per minute, which is the range that people comfortably hear and vocalize words. But if you've listened carefully to numerous African-American and not african american clergy over the last 25 years, their speed is closer to 200 words per minute. I began noticing the speed, the change in the speed of preaching in the late 80s. Certainly several things account for the change in speed of much of today's African-American preaching. However, hip-hop culture especially its music and its approach to delivering the spoken word with rhythms and beats provides one of the best vantage points by which we can understand the change in the speed of speech in African-American culture. In the 1980s, the quick rhythms, rhymes, and cadences of hip-hop culture began firmly implanting themselves within mainstream African-American culture and later in the wider American culture. It was typical to hear those who did not come of age during this period say, when listening to rap music, I don't know what they said in that song. They said it too quickly. Hip-hop lyrics were spoken quicker and in some cases much quicker than the songs that preceded them. Those who were comfortable and grew up with this change in speed, whether they knew it or not, transferred it throughout their lives, including into their preaching. 
Maybe it is incorrect to say that they transferred it, for they were familiar with little else. They were just speaking at a rate that felt natural. This was the pace at which they had come to understand and hear word. Now I just expect faster sermons, especially from preachers age 40-ish and under. I believe that this pace of preaching is the new normal for many. What does this mean long term? It's hard to say. Currently, it means that a slow, brooding Reverend Caesar Clark, the deceased pastor of Good Street Baptist Church, Dallas, might appeal to those of us who love good preaching at any speed, but he would likely lose many of today's young adults and children after 10 or 15 minutes because of his slow pace and his style that left his greatest emotional eruption for the end of the sermon. I vividly recall just 10 or so years ago listening to one of the greatest preachers in the English-speaking world as determined by one magazine and decades of listings of this type, I watched this preacher stand before a young adult audience who cringed as he delivered one slow line after another with numerous pauses. I knew what was happening and so did the pastor who held the guest preacher in high esteem too. A few days later, the pastor confided to me that the chair of his young adult ministry age 35, indicated that perhaps that preacher would be best suited for Seniors Day. The pastor and I were clear that the guest preacher had delivered a sermon that was exegetically sound, that the subject was appropriate for the context, and that we were helped by the sermon and moved by the eloquent use of language by the preacher. But we both also knew what was missing. The speed of the sermon was too slow and the energy level that accompanied the pace of the sermon was not high enough for youth and young adults. Since then, I've seen this happen again and again and again to older and young preachers who spoke too slowly and without too little energy. And, excuse me, and with too little energy. Whether we like it or not, the listening sensibilities of many in our churches have sped up. This means that because sped up speech done well acts as its own medium of emotionally charged speech, a preacher who is comfortable with speed, standing before those who have ears to hear, may be able to evoke as dramatic an impact as the slow old school hooper does in many African-American church contexts. You only have to hear the preaching of Frederick Haynes of Dallas, Lance Watson of Richmond, Virginia, or Jasmine Skurlock of York, Pennsylvania to prove this point. These, uh, these preachers are not old school hoopers, but their speed of speech produces such a powerfully rhythmic and emotionally charged experience that crowds are just as moved as if they were listening to hoopers. View portions of various sermons by, either, uh, by any one of these preachers on YouTube or elsewhere to further understand what I mean. The final change in the mechanics of 21st century preaching that I want to discuss this afternoon can be identified by what I term fire out the gate that permeates. This means that early in the sermon, the preacher has the congregation on its feet for one of several times. This fire or high energy is placed throughout the sermon and results in listeners standing in acknowledgement of things said by the preacher as many as five or six times before the conclusion of the message and again at the conclusion of the message. This preaching is energetic. And often those who do it are drenched with sweat by the midpoint of a message. Preachers who use the fire out the gate that permeates method also tend to involve their bodies frequently in preaching. They do not stand flat-footed and still. Throughout the sermons, their arms flail. 
they may jump, display various head movements, and the entire bodies of some even shake. All of this movement is in keeping with the high level of verbal and physical energy they bring to the preaching moment. There is no way to tell how wild, widespread this practice will become, nor exactly what caused its rise. However, it is clear that this method is now used by many of the best known African American preachers, male and female, and numerous clergy of other ethnicities. Likely television streaming and revival preaching have aided in the prominence of the fire out the gate that permeates method, as it has become common to see preachers in local and national broadcast use it. I'm particularly intrigued by this method of preaching. Although I have only anecdotally studied this method, for a few years, some of, it, uh, some of its aspects are immediately attractive to me. First, I'm attracted to it because it requires that one be especially attentive to each line of a sermon as one determines points, stories, and illustrations that are likely to bring people out of their seats. Let me say that again. First, it requires that one be especially attentive to each line of a sermon as one determines points, stories, and illustrations that are likely to bring people out of their seats, uh, likely to bring people out of their seats, period. Certainly one should always be attentive to each line of a sermon because they are handling the word of God. However, this method of sermon writing almost provides an insurance card to ensure that this is done. The preacher is not out to perform or impress a congregation. He or she simply arranges the sermon in a particular way and is prepared to preach each section with the energy required to gain the desired response from a congregation. It is not easy to get listeners to stand to their feet again and again Sunday after Sunday. Over time, those who preach this way arrange or prepare their sermons in this fashion, and they do it without thinking about it. It becomes instinctual. One selects their big issue or big problem that they want to discuss. They determine what they want people to do as a result of the sermon, and then they design the sermon for maximum impact, and they deliver it with high energy. Second, this type of preaching tends to value illustrations. These high-energy preachers know that illustrations are great, are greatly aid preaching if they are not overused and are on point. This is the second reason this method appeals to me. Third, this style requires great use of one's body. I believe that for too long, the body has been underutilized in preaching even in the African-American church, which is historically known for demonstrative preaching. Although extensive use of the body will certainly not suit every preacher, increased use of the body by those who tend to stand flat-footed could do a great deal to increase the energy level of their preaching. My sense is that most preachers want to offer sermons that are more, not less, energetic. Increased use of the body can help with this. Four, this type of preaching is attractive because it requires continuous energy. And a great deal of modern preaching lacks energy. This explains, in part, the decline in good preaching among so many white denominations and some black ones. Preachers are not trained to deliver the word with power and energy. If the aim is to ensure that people are on their feet at least four or five times before one reaches his or her conclusion in a 20 to 30 minute sermon, preachers will need to maintain a high level of energy throughout the sermon rather than just at the end of the sermon, which is historically the peak of emotional relief in African-American preaching. Please do not misunderstand me. 
the best preachers have, histor have historically offered sermons that were memorable throughout and at the end. However, it takes one type of preaching to make an entire message memorable and another to make it memorable and have people stand to their feet to acknowledge most of the memorable moments. Also, please be clear that having listeners on their feet four or five times during a sermon is not a preaching aim that is to be used as a gimmick for personal aggrandizement. Instead, it is simply an energy gauge for writing and delivering a sermon. Finally, fire out the gate style preaching, as with all preaching, must be occasion appropriate. One may not want to use it during a funeral, wedding, homily, or similar occasion. However, for those who view funerals as celebrate, celebratory homegoings, appropriate for high energy, this now may work there too. <laughs> In summation, the inability to focus sermons remains a problem that plagues most preachers. Focus can be greatly aided if preachers design sermons so that they are behaviorally focused and grounded in solidarity and mutuality with congregations and communities, and if preachers concentrate on becoming stronger writers. Further, preaching is now driven less by cooperative call and response, and preachers need to determine why and if they need call and response that they always lead. Next, technology is now a mainstay in churches. It can help preaching when it is not used as a crutch for preachers and when preachers are aware of what it is doing to them, for them, and for and to the church. Also, hooping long a crown jewel of African-American preaching has transitioned. It now contains less melody. This is good news for young preachers if they are not natural hoopers and for African-American female preachers who have never had enough role models to learn how to hoop well and or were penalized for use of this art form in their preaching because it has historically mainly been done by African-American men. The speed of African-American preaching and preaching by many others in other ethnic communities is faster than in the past. And there has been a rise in preaching that is fiery, energetic at the beginning of sermons, fire out the gate, and this fire permeates entire messages. Historically, changes in preaching, especially in the mechanics, have occurred slowly. But all of the changes that I, of which I have spoken have occurred in the mechanics of preaching in just the last 25 or 35 years. This may mean that just as our society now does everything at Intel 5 processor speed, practitioners of preaching may be doing the same. What this portends for the future of preaching has yet to be well studied. What is clear is that it will continue to be the job of the thoughtful preacher to carefully weigh all changes to ensure that they are used in the service of the gospel, in service of gospel proclamation and the liberation of God's people. Thank you. Thank you.